Okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, my watch has just gone four o'clock, so I'm going to get started because um, I really want to make sure this stays the time so that some of you can go and enjoy some of the other parts of the festival which is taking place today. Um, thank you firstly for coming. I know that this clashes with the evening sessions. Um, I'm sure that when this was finished at Harvard, once you go and see some of the last ones of those, um, you would be very much able to. There is also, from half the onwards, some projections which are going to be taking place at a five o'clock, um, I suppose the ceremonial opening of b and in 2014, so I hope that many of you will stay around for that. Now, this talk is obviously a part of the broader festival today. Um, I mean, I am really, really grateful to be here, taking part in what has been a wonderful day of events, and I hope that many of you have enjoyed um, what you've been involved in so far. And the talk, I suppose, is trying to provide a bit more detail, uh, which fleshes out some of, the, some of the examples we talked about on the walking tours. And I can see quite a lot of familiar faces. Um, so thank you for joining me again to hear more about the Ministry of Information. And um, for those who haven't been on the walking tours, it's my chance to introduce myself as Henry Irving. Um, I am a researcher here in the School of Advanced Studies at the University of, uh, the University of London. Um, and I'm working on um, a research project which is looking at the history of the Ministry of Information. And it's from this which the, uh, the talk I'm going to give you is, is based. Just to say, as a quick plug, if you have enjoyed the events that you've taken uh, taking part in today, there are more Being Human events taking, part, uh, taking place all week, not just in London, uh, but also across the country, um, some of which I'm sure will be of interest to do check out uh, the website, which is beinghuman.org. Um, and you can also, if you're not already, um, follow Being Human on Twitter and also engage in the conversation using the uh, hashtag Being Human. Team. And I keep on getting told to, to tell people to fill in the evaluation box. Many of you have already got one for me. Um, just please, the more information we have, the better. I like it on a day or too much information. Um, and it's on this theme of information that today's talk is based. Because I can be giving you a bit of an insight into the ways in which the Ministry of Information sought to plot civilian morale during the course of the Second World War. And as I said, this is a talk which is based on findings of a four-year Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, which is trying to write a history of the Ministry of Information. It's a project which is taking place within Senate House, um, organised by the Institute of English Studies, um, and is being taken is taking place in collaboration with King's College London and the National Archives. It's quite a collaborative venture, um, and one which I think is quite fitting, uh, given that being human itself is being such a collaborative event through the day. I didn't understand. I, oh dear. <laughs> 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 Sorry, um, anyway, I thought I'd best start by just giving you um, a little bit of an insight into the Ministry of Information. I should say as well, this from the outset, we've had a long day. Um, many of you will know I've just done three tours in a row and my voice is going, so hopefully this talk is going to be quite engaging um, and I'd also like to try and get some feedback from you as we go through, so it's going to be time at the end for questions. Um, but I do want to start with a very, very brief introduction, and namely into the Ministry of Information. So what is this body that we've heard so much about during the course of today? So for those who weren't on the tours, the Ministry of Information was established by the British government in 1939 um, on the outbreak of the Second World War. It was responsible for conducting publicity in Britain and abroad, and it was also um, responsible for controlling the news through censorship and from trying to monitor, um, monitor civilian morale. And I'm going to be speaking for the next 10, 15 minutes or so about this morale function, so how they actually try to sort of get a sense of public opinion during the years 1939 to 1945. Um, and there's going to be, as I say, plenty of opportunities to pass at the end. The talk is very much a part of this too much information feed, trying to think how did the ministry, using the technology available, deal with all of this vast quantities of data that it was gathering on the public's opinion, um, and I mean this was both quantitative and qualitative, as we shall see. Measurement of morale is a really important task for the ministry, because public opinion was regarded as being a key component to any modern conflict. So this is 1939, experience of the First World War has shown how important morale can be. It was widely assumed that the reason that Germany had signed an armistice in November 1918 was because civilian morale in Germany had broken. So thus when planning for the Second World War, the British government were very keen that they should also engage in a propaganda offensive this time round. They believed that it would be a way of shortening any conflict. Now, during the course of the interwar years, developments in aviation had made this even more important. 
because it was widely anticipated that any war would be almost opened by devastating civilian, uh, devastating bombardment for the air, particularly of civilian areas. So it was anticipated that this combination of bombing and the importance of morale to maintain the war effort um, would need some sort of body to organize it. And the Ministry of Information was conceived as a way of plugging that gap. Now, it was widely anticipated that everything would break if the home front broke. So measuring opinion on the home front became in, a, a really integral part of this morale function. And the way that the Ministry set about this task was multifaceted, but as we shall see, it was also um, not without its idiosyncrasies. So, to give you a sense firstly of some initial developments, um, and this is why I remember that I've forgotten mark which slide I need to refer to on my paper. So, um, as we go through, if a random slide appears, I mean, don't be put up, I'll, I'll do my best. But, initial developments um, centre on this lady, Mary Adams, pictured here in a rather lovely 1940s dress. Um, and Mary Adams is important because she played a crucial role in setting up the Ministry's Home Intelligence Division. So despite the perceived importance of its work, um, home intelligence actually had a very confused beginning. There were, in September 1939, some initial attempts to try to experiment with home intelligence machinery. And in order to do this, the Ministry, which was, um, although well-funded, not, um, not particularly well-funded, decided that the best way to do it was to actually go to existing organisations, most notably Mass Observation, which was a pioneering social research organisation and um, whose archive had a store over in Macmillan Hall, um, which some of you may have seen during the course of today. Um, so they approached Mass Observation in order to undertake this machinery um, on their behalf. And these sort of experiments were remarkably short-lived. So, um, although a contract with Mass Observation was signed on the 23rd of September, by the 26th of September it had been cancelled. So this was a three-day experiment. <laughs> um, although the report that Mass Observation took was finally submitted in mid-October. But we can see already in the first six weeks of the war, the only real insight into public opinion that the Ministry of Information has is through anecdotes and through newspapers. Um, other than that, there really is a very sketchy um, organisation on the ground. And the fact that this trial survey uh, commissioned by uh, the Ministry um, was abandoned so early on, um, this really made the situation that much more confused. The Ministry simply did not know how its propaganda was being perceived, and this led to a huge amount of criticism during October of 1939. Why then, you might ask, did the Ministry not sort of really put its emphasis on this public opinion forward from the outset? And I suggest that there are two reasons for this. The first is to do with expenditure. So we live, I suppose, in an era which is defined by talks of cuts and talks of squeezes on public spending. In 1939, the situation is also remarkably similar. There was a desire to keep expenditure, even during a war, to an absolute minimum. And this meant that the Ministry simply weren't willing to risk asking the Treasury to fund what was quite a controversial, um, quite a controversial technique. And this links into the second reason why the Ministry didn't engage in these activities from the outset, and that is a fear of political criticism. So, the idea of a government spying on its public was politically very controversial, and when there were sort of hints of this type of activity, the newspapers really engaged with quite a lot of scaremongering, and the Ministry wanted to avoid this as, uh, to as great a degree as possible. And these interrelated factors, cost and political criticism, meant that until really 1940, there were very few attempts to actually try to measure public opinion during the war. It took five months to overcome these obstacles. And this shift owed so much to Mary Adams, um, who, although a bit difficult to see perhaps, um, but who was integral in um, setting up the, the Home Intelligence Division. Adams, as you might guess here, uh, sitting in front of a microphone, was a BBC television producer and also had worked in radio. She was a scientist by training with a keen interest in social science, and she became the Ministry of Information's first director of home intelligence in November 1939, and then established this division, which became functional really only in April 1940. Adams believed that the maintenance of morale required, and I quote, a continuous flow of information, and for this reason she pioneers the use of public opinion surveys. Crucially, Adams was also able to exploit personal links with mass observation, this organisation that had been brought in earlier. 
in order to make sure that they could undertake reports at a time when the ministry's own functions were still very small scale. So I don't think I don't know. She knew uh, the founder of Mass Observation, one of the founders um, in a personal capacity, she was able to use that link in order to get them to work on their behalf. So then, turning to the reports and turning to how this actually worked. Between the 18th of May and the 27th of September 1940, Home Intelligence compiled daily, uh, daily reports on civilian morale. And this was an effort to provide what Adams called a barometer of public opinion. And there's an example up here of the type of thing that they would find. Little change in morale, <coughs> cheerfulness, increasing confidence, and so on. Um, the reason why I've selected this one is that this was a report submitted one day after the Ministry of Information had come under huge press criticism, um, when, ironically, its Home Intelligence Division had been outed. Um, and we're going to come on to that in a moment. But Home Intelligence found that several people expressed the opinion that the attack on the ministry is a press stunt. So there's actually a bit of sympathy, um, although this was only more politically minded people. The average person, it noted, was not affected. <laughs> so these type of reports, of which, as I say, were compiled daily um, between the 18th of May and 27th of September, provide a fascinating insight into British public opinion during what, was, um, what, what has become known as the Battle of Britain. And these do, therefore, they, they make a really interesting historical source. The reports were compiled using material from mass observation, um, and this was submitted alongside reports from the Ministry's <coughs> own intelligence network, its regional offices, um, and then also using Adams' links with the BBC, BBC listener surveys, and secret sources such as postal censorship. So as well as the newspaper censorship, which I explained in the tours, people's personal mail was also intercepted. And actually, that's what was it feed into these reports. Was there a particular rumour? Could it then be traced to source? And all of that went into these at that time. And the reports were presented as written statements, like the example um, on the screen, um, which paid particular attention to rumours and also to reactions to the news. In this case, the news that the Ministry of Information had come under attack. Um, and after the 27th of September 1940, these daily reports were replaced by a weekly summary, um, which Although the material was still compiled on a daily basis, the, the weekly summaries tried to condense it and make it a bit more user friendly. And it's these weekly summaries that uh, we have produced some examples of upstairs. So if you've not already had a look, the Ministry of Information exhibition taking place on the mezzanine level, there are a number of examples of these weekly reports which cover the week, including the 15th of November, from 1940 right the way through to 1944. Um, they are text based. But if you've got the, I don't know, spare 10 minutes to go and have a read of some, they are fascinating. Give a real insight into shifts of public opinion. The important thing, though, about these reports is that although they are written, they were complemented by more visual forms of presentation, particularly, I should say, as the walk progressed. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but what I will do my best to is to explain what it is. And this is a graph showing civilian morale. It goes from March 1941 right the way through to December 1944. And you can see on this top line various peaks and troughs as morale changes over time. Each of these different events is correlated by a particular event in the war. And we can see the lowest point uh, here is to do with the uh, evacuation from Crete of British forces. The highest point over here is to do with the first fighting on German soil. So they're tracing morale and then trying to correspond it with particular events within the war. And this chart was, it worked on a 30 point scale. Now, this is where it starts becoming a little bit more technical. Because in order to try to quantify morale, they had to think of certain sort of corresponding, um, corresponding scales in order to try to do this. And this is a, a challenge which um, our colleagues over at the Mass Observation Archive are doing games in today. And you, if you have got time after this talk, can go and say how you're feeling on a scale of 1 to 10, and they will then be able to visualise that data in a very, very similar way. So do please go and have a, look, uh, have a look at that. And I should note, actually, having gone over to the stall in McMahon just earlier, um, I can see that this type of technique is very much based on the type of things that mass observation were doing. So here is a, uh, an example from... Uh, November 1940. November 1940, <laughs> oh, thank you, of people's morale. And so you can see these type of techniques, pioneered by mass observation, formalised and made perhaps more scientific in some respects by um, the more statistical surveys to be taking uh, place within Senate House. Now, 
what the chart also did in order to try to augment its scientific value, and I should say actually that the 30 point scale that they used, um, this was not the most scientific, it was originally a 20 point scale, and then people started feeling happier. So they are. <laughs> um, but how they do this, I don't know. Um, but, well, we're trying to find out. Um, but in order to try to make this more scientific, you will see that they correlated that 30 point scale with this line running along the bottom. And what this was, was a statistical um, analysis taken from British Institute of Public Opinion polls, which was the forerunner of the Gallup poll, which used quantitative social sampling techniques in order to try to um, gauge people's, well, in this case, it was trying to gauge people's opinion on the government's conduct of the war. And what they did this for is to try to see, well, are our findings actually working? And you can see that there is a correlation between the two lines, which suggests that regardless of whether the qualitative or quantitative things <coughs> are used, the public's opinion did shift over time, and that in many respects this was linked into certain key events during the war. So this is a fascinating source in terms of the, the coming together of the quantitative and the qualitative. It's really a very important uh, moment in the sort of birth of scientific market research. Now, the gradual shift towards more scientific methods um, also had an impact on the sample survey techniques that were adopted. And as the division's mechanisms were expanded, research was increasingly brought in-house, and the original um, sort of experiments with mass observation were put to one side. Instead, the Ministry's own <coughs> investigators were deployed to measure the effect of the Ministry's other activities. And a man called Dr. Stephen Taylor, who took over from Mary Adams in 1941, and it was his room we went past on there for those of us all, room 224, um, Stephen Taylor promised that he would be able to deliver rapid and accurate survey machinery uh, for the study campaigns. And Taylor was especially keen to try to measure the impact of the ministry's publicity and propaganda because he felt that it was often poorly targeted and had a tendency to lack personal appeal. And here is a quote from Taylor where he explains that previously there hadn't been the machinery in place, um, but right now he believed there was accurate survey machinery that would be available for the study campaigns. And November 1941 is an important shift. Mass Observation's contract had been ended just two months earlier, and Taylor was adamant that this was a, a way of really establishing his own vision for home intelligence after Mary Adams had left. And the more systematic approach uh, to public opinion made particular use of the quantitative wartime social survey unit, which I mentioned upstairs as the WSS. This had been um, initially set up under the auspices of the National Institute of Economic <coughs> Social Research in April 1940 and was originally um, led by a member of the University of London staff. It was, in many respects, it was an academic venture that was then brought in-house by the government, um, although it was given seed funding by the government, so it's a bit of a complicated relationship. Um, and the WSS conducted sample surveys on a vast range of subjects during the course of the war. Um, I think for those who were upstairs, I quoted hairdressing difficulties. Um, I might also have mentioned uh, people's opinions towards educational reform. Um, there were also surveys into recycling, into food, into cooking habits, a whole range of things. Each of the surveys was designed in the Senate House um, and were undertaken by teams of trained interviewers who were sent across the country. And we can see how this works by looking at some of the photographs. So, um, top left, you have here the sampling technique. So, the actual decision to locate on a map which houses should be approached um, for the survey to, to undertake the survey. Um, and then you can see that it goes through to the survey actually being undertaken. You have the image um, on the top right of the survey um, actually interviewing um, one of the recipients. The results are then brought back to Senate House where they're put onto these punch cards and then they're tabulated and latterly they're analysed. Um, now this example was a survey conducted on housing in 1944 and the gentleman on the top left, Geoffrey Thomas, is coming up with the <coughs> sample um, and then it is Margaret Thomas, who I believe is his wife, quite a lot of couples would meet and meet in the MRI. Margaret Thomas undertaking uh, part of the sample in London um, and it's her again on the top right and it comes back to the analysis. Um, this would then be written into a report, and in this case, actually, it was given to, I think, the Ministry of uh, Reconstruction. What did the public want new housing to look like after the war? So you've had the blitz, you've had bombing, how do we move forward from this? And these type of surveys would actually inform the shift after the war towards the use of more, um, I suppose, modern methods, uh, which perhaps now we associate with high-rise flats, but at the time, we were perceived in a slightly different way. 
Now, each of these surveys used a representative sample of between two and three parts of respondents, um, and these type of activities were, in many respects, groundbreaking for the government. Um, it was a development in the relationship between the state and British society that simply hadn't been uh, the case before the war. And actually, during the, the course of the conflict, over 300,000 people were surveyed in this way. So a vast number of the British public asked their opinion on various different things. What then, um, before we end, was the impact? Um, now it's clear from well, that, uh, what then was the impact? So it's clear from the conclusions from home intelligence and these social survey reports um, that actually they did have some impact on the Ministry of Information's activities. The weekly reports that we have uh, reproduced examples of upstairs led to an understanding of morale that saw morale as being a mixture of attitudes and behaviours, and that was really important, that informed a lot of the Ministry's work. The wartime social survey findings, like those uh, in the housing example, also helped the Ministry to hone its approach to propaganda, and we can see how this develops, again, by looking at some of the publicity produced at different points in the war, of which there are, again, some examples of the exhibition. Um, nevertheless, the political criticism that had dogged home intelligence from its, um, from its outset was never entirely overcome. In Ju uh, July 1940, as we saw in the, the example, the Ministry came under a sustained attack in the newspapers when the existence of home intelligence was made public for the first time. Again, there were links to a Gestapo record, the accusation that the government was spying. And even later in the war, um, there was a further outbreak of this criticism. The, 19, the 1940 criticism of it was the press coined the term Cooper's Snoopers after the second Minister of Information, no, third Minister of Information, Doc Cooper. Later on, they used the not as snappy title, Bracker's Trackers after <laughs> Bracken. Um, there were also further questions about finance. So, the employment of mass observation during 1940 41 is a case point because the reliance on, uh, sort of reliance on temporary contracts, £100 a week to keep mass observation uh, working for the Ministry, was seen to be too expensive. And there was an additional threat in April 1942, where Winston Churchill wanted to know how many people were employed by a report which he doubted was in the, the trouble. But luckily for us, it was decided that these type of activities were too important to simply fold. Um, and it is the existence of this material that actually makes my job working on this project that much more exciting. Because we can, for the first time, gauge the impact of the Ministry's activities. And no other history has tried to do that so far, and it's something that we're really excited about doing. Um, but for now, I'd like to open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes. If anyone has any questions on home intelligence, I'll do my best to try and answer some. And back. Um, how accurate do you think those surveys, those surveys were, the results? How accurate? Um, obviously, this is a really difficult, and anyone with a sort of background in any sort of like social research, this is really, really difficult. The way that the Ministry saw this, is that they claimed that this was not accurate in terms of, um, it was only as accurate as those who were giving the answers and those who were analysing them for what it was. So there was these number of caveats. They knew that it wasn't exactly representative, but they believed it could be a barometer, and particularly over a long period of time, that it could give a sense of changes in the public's attitudes. Now, the more targeted wartime social survey ones, which tended to be a snapshot of a particular campaign, because they used more scientific methods, they were actually pretty accurate. I mean, modern market research, um, although now it's mostly done through telephone polling, still uses samples of between two to three thousand people. They still use the same techniques of actually being able to sort of isolate who is going to be phoned up. So actually, a lot of those techniques are being used and continue to be used. Um, so in that sense, we can be fairly, you know, we know it's not an exact record, but we can be fairly confident. Were there any benefits to respondents when paid? No, no, it's purely voluntary. So this is, people were given the opportunity, would you like to uh, you know, take part in the survey? But there was no financial incentive. Um, and actually one of the things that many of the earliest surveys reflect on is, people were remarkably and forthcoming. And this just, this bugs and bewilderment. The, even the people going out and doing the survey don't expect people to invite them to their homes, to give them a cup of tea, and to actually get involved. Um, but you actually do get the sense that the public are brought in and the relationship is, is quite conducive. It's the newspapers that seem to spin this and they, they sort of have these scare stories about the ministry spying on people. Um, what we can see from the, sort of the, the actual source material seems to be that the public are quite willing to get involved. I mean, this is the first time many of them will have ever heard.
Um, any questions yet? Yeah? Uh, have you got an example of where, public, where the, the government's attitude was changed because of the outcome of the, camp of the surveys? Okay, um, an example that we've been doing a bit of work on at the moment has been, um, if anyone went to Simon Elliott's talk earlier talking about, uh, about publishing, the importance of paper to the industry's work, so paper is incredibly scarce. Um, and during the course of the Second World War, there were very elaborate recycling schemes to try to bring more paper in. Now, actually, there's a number of surveys that have taken into the public's attitude towards recycling, which did then have an impact on the campaigns, and um, particularly the, the use of radio broadcasts. And actually, the Ministry um, initially hadn't made as much use of the BBC as perhaps had been expected, but radio was seen as being the most important method of publicity because it got into the person's home. And because it's a bit more conversational, it's not as, I suppose, as, as much of a disconnect between a poster and a, a viewer on the street, actually in the home, in a comfortable surrounding. And after these findings, the Ministry does start to make more use of radio in its broadcasts. And there is a broad trend during the course of the Second World War between what is often termed as a more sort of exhortatory, a, a sort of demanding, you must do this uh, type of approach, towards one which is more about explanation. We are doing this because. And a lot of that shift can actually be traced to findings from, uh, from surveys like this, because the public it was found didn't like being lectured. Uh, question back. 1939 to 42 is a particularly challenging period for mass observation. Lots of, uh, um, for Ministry of Information, lots of political, economic and organisational challenges, uh, with, a, with a sense of growing confidence thereafter, especially under Brett Bracken. Is that reflected, that growing sense of confidence, reflected in the use of certain survey techniques and applications and, and the belief in what can be uh, drawn? <laughs> yeah, the, the correlation is almost, I mean, it's almost exact. So it's hard to say what is the cause and what is the effect, but certainly they go hand in hand. So as the Ministry itself becomes more confident, so too does this type of activity. And in terms of the, the financing, I mean, to begin with, it is, it's, it's a shoestring budget. We're talking here, sort of £100 a week is, is too much, we need to get rid of that. Whereas later on, they're employing 56 trained investigators of their own. They have this vast machinery kind of in, in place. And actually that funding is linked into a greater sense of confidence in the Ministry's own work, which I suppose reflects its I suppose a slightly more favoured position in, in terms of um, sort of parliament and British government by the latter period of the war. So they do, they, they work hand in hand. Um, we have time for two more questions, I think, if there are any. Uh, gentlemen, the front. Is there anything uh, comparable to this that went on for the First World War? Because um, I often wonder what, what the public opinion was in what, what the First World War, the sheer ghastliness of trench warfare. Mm -hmm were reminded by the poppies and so on. Um, and it's never been very clear to me. That's a fantastic question, great timing as well. Um, now, there isn't this sort of um, very formal investigative technique. However, censorship material is used. So just as during the Second World War, the press, is, uh, the press and letters are intercepted. Letter intercepts are used to shape morale uh, or to measure morale during the First World War. So that is going from soldiers back to the home front, and then that is from Britain going out to the trenches. And there are particular letters from soldiers that are essentially intercepted twice, once at point of being written, and then once at the point of perception. And those were used to shape broad trends in public opinion. But it isn't anywhere near as comparable as this. And I mean, the Second World War is the first time that many of these techniques, I mean, mass observation was founded at the end of the 1930s, British Institute of Public Opinion in 1937, I mean, market research just started getting going. And again, this war comes in and those techniques are adopted. That hadn't been the case in the First World War. This simply wasn't the mechanism of that. Um, so censorship was more important. Now we have one last question. I did see a hand towards the back. I think it was you, wasn't it? Go on. Yeah. Um, how long were, was allowed for each interview? Oh, place? that's a brilliant question again. Um, now, most of the the techniques adopted, they were, I mean, they came almost wholesale from mass observation and also from the British Institute of Public Opinion. In 1939, when there had been this experimental use, both groups had given essentially their documents that explained their processes to the ministry. And actually, the, the quantitative side is it, very similar to the, to the British Institute. They were as long as they would last. I mean, they used this sort of cohesion technique where you'd go in, you'd have what was effectively a, a sort of normal conversation, but then they 
the interview web is trying to isolate whether that's a yes or no. So they would ask opinion, but then they would have to put that one on a scale. As the war progressed, they became slightly more nuanced in this. Most answers weren't just yes, no, they were sort of a degree, almost like a one to five type scale, like we, we might use in opinion surveys now. Um, but they would take as long as they took. So actually each survey took quite a long time to, to put together. They usually would take about two or three weeks to get around the 2000, um, which meant that unfortunately, there is only a limited number of these surveys available. So our coverage isn't, isn't entire, you know, there's still patchy, some areas weren't surveyed, others were. And that really reflects what were seen to be the most important topics at the time by the ministry. So even the, the sort of dearth of the survey actually tells us something, although we have to sort of, uh, sort of hypothesise slightly. I think we've hit it. <laughs> um, thank you all very much. If people do have any personal questions, please do come and uh, approach me. Uh, sort of, I will do my best to answer them. If you've not already, do have a look at the exhibition. Um, and then also just to say there are other things going on through this evening, and again, all the way through the week. You can also, as you can see on here, find out more about the project at myditor.ac.uk or find me on Twitter at myditor. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you all very much.